All right, hey everyone. Um, welcome back. We might just give it one more minute as a couple of uh, people start to roll in on the live stream. Um, but I hope you can hear me okay. Let me know if you can't. Um, otherwise, yeah, welcome back. Hope it all went well. Give us some life in the in the chat. Good to hear how you're all going on this Tuesday uh, afternoon, or at least it's Tuesday afternoon over here for me in Melbourne. Awesome, so thanks Brittany. Good to see a bit of life over there in the chat. Um, look, I'll, I'll just, let's kind of get started quickly today. Um, today's session is going to be run uh, kind of a little bit in two parts. So I'll be taking the first hour to hour and a half of this session. And then Gwil will be jumping on at the back end of the session to demonstrate a few things. Um, but generally, as you probably know from the uh, course outline, that Today we're looking in particular at sequencing or fabrication instructions and creating sequences in both Rhino and Grasshopper. So just um, straight off the bat, oh yeah, cool, awesome. Hey everyone, I'm just checking the group chat. Monday night in LA, yeah, I'm guessing it's pretty late over there. And Argentina, I guess it's pretty late there as well, probably the same time zone as, um, as LA. Um, before we get started, it'd be great if everyone could just jump on and download these two template files that I've uploaded to the community forum. I might just post a quick link in the chat for everyone um, to go ahead and grab. I think that'll work. Uh, I haven't really tested it in the chat before. Yeah, it seems to work. So if everyone could just quickly go ahead and download those, um, those two files because we'll just run through them in the workshop today and that'll just um, give you guys like a base thing to work off. Um, cool. Um, so whilst you're downloading that I'll just give you a brief just update on specifically what we're going to be doing today. So obviously if we're looking at fabrication sequencing it's a little bit more specific to that. Um, we're going to be basically spending like the first hour and a half or two hours I said um, exploring these sequences or fabrication instruction events. We're going to look at it firstly through a brick stacking project. So you would have seen um, brick stacking project presented by Gwil yesterday in the lecture. Um, we're going to look a little bit um, in more depth detail onto the technical side of that in Grasshopper and Rhino and give you guys a little bit more of an understanding of how to create simple fabrication sequences using Grasshopper. And then um, on top of that, we're also going to take a look at how to create fabrication sequences just natively in Rhino. So if you're not as comfortable using Grasshopper or if you want to quickly create some fabrication sequences or if you want to save the, um, you know, an application onto your mobile device and use it um, offline without um, the live link to Rhino, you could do that through, you know, a Rhino based uh, fabrication um, sequencing. Um, so we'll look at both techniques in the first little part of this, uh, this session. Then uh, after that, once we've got a bit of a feel for how the sequencing kind of works and looked, looked at a couple more uh, complex and different sequencing patterns, we're going to then try and apply some of that sequencing logic to the um, timber fields up designs and algorithms that we were creating yesterday. So then you could go ahead and apply some of that uh, fabrication sequencing logic to your own devices. So then after that, Gwil's going to take over and jump onto the live stream and he'll give a little bit more of a technical description of one of the component, components I'm going to introduce, um, which is the state gate component in Grasshopper. But we'll talk about that a little bit later, but he'll give a bit of background on some of the use cases for that and how it can be like a powerful tool um, when you're building fabrication-based applications inside of Grasshopper. 
Gwil will also then discuss the, fabric the fabrication design task for today, uh, and he's going to introduce um, a new tool that's going to allow us to collaboratively share our 3D models together, so we can all kind of view um, what the design ideas and outcomes are from you know today's kind of little design task that we're going to set for everyone to have a look at. Uh, so once you've gone ahead, um, just for anyone jumping on the chat quickly again, just head over to this link and download those two Grasshopper files. And once you've downloaded those guys, I want everyone to just go ahead and open up a blank Rhino document. Um, try, could you please set your units to, to millimeters? So this first um, algorithm we're gonna look at, the brick stacking one, um, is tailored to millimeters in terms of the units. So to do that, you could you know, change it at the start or you could just type in units into Rhino. Um, and you'll get you know the document properties come up and you can easily just swap over to millimeters so um, just highly recommend you jump over to millimeters before we get started I'm gonna go ahead and launch grasshopper and the first uh, file that I want us just to open is the um, the grasshopper file about brick stacking so the one that we're looking at is this one here brick wall design underscore template file. So if everyone could just open that and get that one up on their screen, um, you should have something that looks like this, uh, just on your screen straight away. And I'll just give everyone a minute to get there. Um, the definition looks something like that. Okay, so hopefully everyone's got that on their screen. Um, if you need a little bit more time, just let me know in the group chat and I can slow down a little bit. Otherwise, um, we might as well just get stuck into it. So as I kind of mentioned, in this first session, we're going to demonstrate these two different approaches to creating fabrication instructions. The first is going to be through a more... Oh, asking for the tree sloth plugin. Um, Sorry, Juan, I just saw that you've got a little message. So don't worry about the tree swath, sloth plugin. Um, I made a little bit of a mistake in that and chosen the wrong component. Uh, that's my bad there. Could everyone just go to the end of the definition over here? It's this uh, little component here that everyone will be missing. I think that you can get this component without tree sloth. I couldn't remember which one was the right one, to be honest. If you double click on the canvas, could you just type in shift paths? Um, and see if that's coming up. I think that's probably where the problem is, just over here. Um, so there should be a shift pass component. I'm just going to check my definition. Ah, yeah, no, it's probably here. Yeah, so it's this one here. Sorry, guys. Um, that's my bad. I'm just going to give everyone a minute. Do you want to go to stagger polyline lengths with gaps? And you'll probably have a gap here. It looks something like that. Just double click on the canvas and grab this purple shift pass component. That's uh, my bad, I didn't realize that I had the, um, there's like two versions of that component going up. And basically you just want to plug the data into there um, and, ooh, that's that going to do, shift out of existence. Uh, that's my bad actually. So let's go ahead, uh, let's just delete that component and plug that into that guy, or well, that might crash it actually. We want to flatten coming into that guy. So don't do what I just did. Sorry, I've made a bit of a mess of this one just straight off the bat. So I'm just going to start a new Rhino file. Oh wait, no, there we go. Let's flatten uh, that list item going into there and then that should fix the problem straight away. So just flatten coming out of list item um, and plug into the weave component in there. I'll give everyone a minute to do that. Sorry about that guys. I have just um, a slightly different plugin installed that um, gave me a little bit of a confusing thing. So once again, I'm guessing everyone just has like something that looks like um, this, just at the stagger polyline lengths with gaps area. I just want everyone to just flatten, um, so right click on the eye output and flatten, 
and then plug into the um, one input in Weave and that'll fix up your definition. So give me a little bit of life in the group chat if anyone's having a bit of an issue with that. My apologies, I didn't realise I had um, that plugin installed on this, on this machine. Cool, did that work for everyone? So basically you should, once you've flattened, really important to flatten out of there and then just plug that into there and you should just get a little kind of coloured brick wall that looks something like that. Yeah, cool, I think that's working well for everyone then. Um, I might go and quickly save that one out and I can quickly update that on the, um, on the community forum for everyone in the next couple of minutes. Um, Cool. Yeah, if you're getting a point at the origin, that's fine. So my point's sitting at the origin too. So just zoom out and you should be able to see that overall brick wall. I can go and update that file pretty quickly. Just give me a second as well if you want to just download it again. Uh, one second. Cool. I've just re-uploaded the file if um, anyone's having any issues. So you can go on to the fabrication instructions and re-download that one. Um, so, okay, let's get back into this. I'm just going to kind of briefly explain what's kind of happening in this definition. Basically, um, all that's really occurring here is um, we're getting just a base surface, and you can bottle up any surface in, um, in Rhino um, like that, and you could go ahead and plug it in as long as it's a surface. Um, all we're doing in this situation is we're just contouring that surface, so we're creating a bunch of lines. Then over here, basically what we're doing is we're creating a bunch of polylines that are kind of staggered so that you get a staggered kind of brick stacking approach. Um, and basically um, you essentially end up with like this jagged polyline. Then over here we're basically inserting some gaps in by just kind of shortening each of those polyline lengths like that. Um, then at the top here we're actually writing a little attractor point um, rotation thing. So if you've used Grasshopper before you've probably worked with attractor points and what that'll do is it'll actually rotate uh, basically the planes that each of these lines are sitting on so that um, each of the bricks come out slightly rotated based on their distance to in this case an attractor point which currently sits at the origin. So the first thing that we're going to do basically is make this attractor point a um, interactive attractor point um, which um, is basically going to be a follow-on from what we were doing uh, in yesterday's course. So I'm going to go ahead um, and I'm just going to create a mesh sphere like we created the other day. So that'll create it at the origin. And we probably want to make it a little bit bigger because we're working in millimetres today. So maybe let's go ahead and make it like 40 millimetres. Just like that. And once again, I'm going to use a sync object component. And I'm going to send that object to Follogram. Actually, let's make that a little bit bigger. Maybe something like that will be a good kind of size. And as we remember from yesterday, we could go and change this to like, you know, a different color. I'm going to make mine a nice blue color. 
and I also want to make it a movable object. Basically, we're going to tether this sphere so it becomes the attractor point on our brick wall. So as you kind of get closer to it in AR, the bricks will all rotate for you um, as you kind of move that sphere around. So you're kind of creating like an interactive attractor point. So I'm going to create, uh, as we did yesterday, pretty much the same thing. I'm going to create a little mesh container. And then we're going to do a mesh area. Or we could do just an area, actually. Let's just do an area. Areas, a good component. And then that'll just give us the centroid of that geometry there. So I'm going to go and plug that centroid into this point here. So this little purple point. And we create that little relationship that you know serves this, um, this little sphere as our attractor point in our definition. So essentially the same concepts as what we're doing yesterday with the um, with the field simulations where we were moving uh, the spheres around to kind of update the curve location or we were moving the planes around to kind of update the location of the spin forces themselves. Cool, and once you've done that, um, just go to the end of the definition where you've got this mesh output. And we're just going to create a sync object component. And I'm going to plug the meshes into the sync object. Basically, these meshes are these colorful bricks that we've got coming out here. Um, and the sync object component is going to go ahead and show them um, inside of Fologram. So essentially, what you could think about with um, with this from potentially like a fabrication perspective is that we've got this brick wall, right? And we have all of these rotating bricks. And you could imagine that um, as the bricks kind of, you know, rotate, the surface area connecting between each of the bricks is actually a lot smaller than the rotation area. And in the non-rotation area, they're a lot larger. So it's probably a bit easier to view in rendered mode, or oh, maybe not as much actually. Um, so you could almost think as these bricks that are sitting within you know, this rotation field as being a little bit more tricky to fabricate because they, are, um, they have less surface area when they're stacked on top of each other, so they're more prone to maybe collapsing or falling. What you could do is maybe go over to the gradient bar just over here, and we could just swap these colors so that they're a little bit more logical. So we could say, you know, red in terms of like a fabrication perspective is a little bit more tricky, and green is like good. It's really easy to fabricate. So if you want to go ahead and swap those two things as well, um, and if you haven't already synchronized that um, geometry up, let me know in the chat if we're all looking okay up to date um, and then we can keep pushing on forward Cool, so I mean, I'm not getting any alarm bells in the chat, so hopefully everyone's kind of still on track. What we're going to go ahead and do now is just connect our devices up to, um, up to our live Rhino session. So as you kind of remember from yesterday, the first thing you just want to make sure is that your um, device is on the same Wi-Fi network as your PC, so we can create that uh, live connection. So let's go over to the Fologram tab. If you don't see the tab once again, just a reminder, you can type Fologram into the command line and then it should appear. Um, so just make sure you do that if you're not seeing it. And let's go ahead and click on connect to device and we will get a QR code to scan um, straight away. So once you've got that kind of de device connection, you should be able to go ahead and scan with your device. So I'll demonstrate that with my phone. Um, so I've got the Fologram app open. Just pull it onto the screen over here, and you can all see that nicely. Um, we're going to go ahead and connect a device. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to scan. Oops, mine's just frozen for a second. There we go. I'm going to scan the QR code, and straight away I get, you know, 
this uh, model appearing. So I can go and drop this onto the canvas somewhere. I might just drop it there for now. Um, all my brick walls behind me, as you can kind of see. Uh, just for this little kind of design exercise, perhaps what you could do is you could go into edit mode, which is the option in the bottom right, obviously, and we can maybe just scale it down and then rotate that brick wall around so we can easily see what we're doing to the design as we kind of move it around. So now you see my brick wall is sitting there um, nicely, and I could go ahead and, you know, move this sphere, and that'll update the rotation of the bricks, and it'll also give me some visual feedback um, of those brick colours. So one thing you would have noticed um, that's a little bit different from yesterday, yesterday, oh, and, and I guess with this mesh sphere as well, we were specifying um, a very specific colour uh, inside of the sync object component for the geometry that we're synchronising. But what Fologram also does is it's able to take mesh vertice colours um, in and um, send them in AR as well. So right now I haven't actually specified any kind of color value other than the default in this sync object component. So what Fologram is doing is it's taking all of the vertex colors from these brick geometries and applying them in AR. So you can easily go and move that point around um, and update you know, the brick wall itself. So I'll give everyone just a minute to get to there. Um, if you have any issues, please let me know in the group chat um, and we can keep moving forward um, if everything is going okay with everyone. Cool, so um, I'm seeing that a few people are having a few issues seeing the wall. It could be because the wall is really big and behind you, so just have a quick look around the room um, and just make sure that you've got the sync object um, component plugged in. Instead, in terms of the connection issues, I might leave it to Gwil. Gwil's floating around the chat and he can give you a hand with those things. Um, uh, maybe just give us a bit of clarification. You, are you guys scanning the QR code and you're getting a connection error? Um, are you able to put the QR code up at all? It would be good to get a little bit more info from the guys who are having a bit of a connection issue, uh, the synchronization of the devices. Yep, so um, I saw some questions about how to move the ball. So if you um, aren't able to move the ball, just remember that you want to go up to here to sync object and right click and make sure that movable is selected. So if your ball isn't move, like if I went and unchecked that on my end, you'll notice that you know I try and move this around. I'm just trying to click and drag on my phone and I can't actually move that ball around into place. But if I right click on the sync object and I make it movable, you should be able to go ahead and move that ball in space and your wall will update as you're kind of going around like that. And one last thing, really simple thing that we can go ahead and add as well, um, I might just dump it over here. We might be able to go and just quickly synchronize a parameter. So in Fologram, I'm just going to go to the sync um, tab 
and I'm going to click on sync parameters. Um, and maybe the parameter that we can sync is just this guy here. It's a number slider that's the value of 25. I might actually right click on that and just rename it as angle. So what this will enable you to do is basically change the angle of um, the, um, the brick rotation that we're seeing in AR. Yeah, so gee, I mean, as I said before, make sure that your sync object is set to movable. And then all you need to do is click and drag on your device and you should be able to move that blue ball around um, easily. So please make sure that you've gone into the, um, the sync object component and enabled movable. Make sure that your sphere is set, sorry I think I just got a little blep in the studio, make sure that um, you're not in edit mode. So if you're in edit mode, you'll end up moving the whole, um, the whole model around. So make sure you're out of edit mode and that kind of right hand menu isn't appearing. All right, so um, hopefully most of you have been able to get the brick wall up on your device and you're able to view it on your, um, on your mobile phone. Um, I just saw another one. So three, as I mentioned before, just make sure that you put this little mesh component in. Basically, there's issues with this area component in Grasshopper. It's kind of poorly written. So just make sure you go um, sync object mesh geometry. Um, that's probably what you're missing and why you're getting that area properties issue. Alright, so hopefully all of you have the brick wall on your device and you're able to view it easily. So I guess the question now is what if we wanted to go and build this? If we wanted to go and build this wall, um, would we just view this and start placing the bricks um, in um, our locations? Um, no, we, we wouldn't. We would obviously want to create some fabrication sequences that will step through each of, um, each of these brick courses. So we're going to come over to the far right over here, where we've got our sync object coming out over here. And we're going to adapt the, um, the algorithm a little bit to step through each course in the brick wall. So if you've used Grasshopper before, you'd know a little bit about data structures. You'd at least know that um, they kind of exist. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to basically hover over the output of mesh maybe to start with and you'll see that the mesh output which contains all of our bricks is kind of a data structure and the way the data structure is organized is that each of these kind of layers or contours of bricks are actually on their own data branch. So we don't need to worry too much about that right now. All we want to worry about is um, in Grasshopper is basically creating a component that's going to enable us to select each branch one by one. So the component that we're going to look for is just called the tree branch component. So it looks a little bit like that. Um, so just let me know if everyone's able to see that tree branch component. I don't want another issue uh, like the one I had before with the path shift. So could someone just tell me in the chat that they can find the tree branch component easily and then we can go from there. Uh, and there's a question about the sync parameters. So the sync parameters component, basically it's not about connecting anything. If you just drop the sync parameters component onto the canvas, it, oops, it by default doesn't have um, any connections, but then you just go and click on the Fologram logo, okay? Cool, looks like everyone has that tree branch component, which is good to see. Oh, and I should mention that obviously that parameter is now synced on our device, so you could go and like adjust the angle. So I could make it a much larger angle and that'll update on my brick wall. I can make it a smaller angle and that'll update as well. And you can kind of see that live update as you're going. So you don't want that angle to be too big. If the angle's too big, you won't be able to fabricate it. Okay, so what we can do with the tree branch component is we can just plug this mesh input into there and we need to specify a path. So when you hover over the mesh output, you see in the far left, we have all these numbers from zero up to 48, and those are basically the path numbers. Basically, our tree branch component will let us select one of those groups of 13. So I'm going to go ahead and create a number slider that's um, just 
maybe a value of 20. And I'm going to plug that into the path component. And what it'll do is it'll select um, branch number 20 from this tree. So you hover over tree, we're selecting the 20th branch. We can go and plug that into our sync object component and that should update our phologram output to just show us the 20th course of bricks. So you can kind of see in my application that I've only got that 20th course of bricks now. And you can go and drag this one down and easily change um, the viewing port. I'm just going to right click on that mesh and turn the preview off so that we don't see it and then we only see this, um, this uh, tree branch preview coming through. So now you can easily go and slide this. And what we could do is we could also um, just jump on the number slider and right click and call that course. So as if it were like a brick course. And we could also synchronize that up to our phologram device. So it appears on our device. And then we can actually control that you know, remotely from our device. So I'll give everyone just a minute to um, get to that. And let me know if you have any issues on the chat with the algorithm itself. Um, James, just I'm um, seeing that you're having issues connecting. Have one quick solution that you could just quickly try is maybe just closing the Phologram app on your phone, like hard closing it and then reopening it and maybe same with the Rhino file and just see if that maybe solves your issues, just maybe a hard reset would. I'm not sure if it will, but maybe that's um, an approach you could just quickly try as well. Okay. Um, Cool, so we're all looking good on the group chat. It'd be good to know if everyone's got to a point where they're able to um, basically create one course of their bricks and then send that course uh, parameter to their device so they can easily go through each of those items um, one by one, each of those courses. Okay, I'm not getting lots of responses in the group chat, so I'll just assume everyone was able to do that without too many issues. Um, let me know if you had a problem in the chat, of course, um, and we can try and resolve that. So if you've got there, I mean, congratulations, you've made your first kind of fabrication sequence. Obviously, now we're kind of getting to a point where you could start controlling, you know, which bricks you're laying. So once you've laid one course, you could easily then just step up one and move to like the next course um, just directly from your application. But one thing that we kind of found when we were um, when we were running you know our own brick projects in Phologram is that fabricating, especially with the Hololens, is quite difficult to get accurate if you're just seeing the shaded version of the bricks. So if you're just seeing shaded um, inputs of the bricks like we've got in our mobile application right now, it's actually quite tricky to get the accuracy right um, because the depth perception and the alignment is a little bit tricky um, generally speaking. So we actually kind of came up with a few different approaches. We did a few different tests as to the best approach of um, you know showing these bricks and as you can kind of see in this image we basically came to an approach where we would just show the top outline of a brick um, as a preview, and then we would show the next course below it as a shaded preview, just so you could kind of know which course you are up to. Basically then the bricklayer is able to grab his brick, place it into the current course, and align it perfectly to those top edges, because we found the bottom um, edges and the bottom kind of shaded view of the brick to actually be a little bit too much information to show. So sometimes when you're fabricating in AR, it's important to understand 
how much information you actually need to show. So in this case, for the bricks, it's actually better to show less information than to show more information. So rather than showing um, a fully shaded brick, what we might do instead is um, just um, discuss how we might show just the top outline. So what we've got in our tree branch is a bunch of meshes. I'm going to use a component called face boundaries. So just let me know if you don't have that component. I'm pretty sure it's a native one in Grasshopper, so everyone should have face boundaries. And this will basically find every face in a mesh geometry and create an outline around its mesh face. So I'm going to drop that onto the canvas and plug the branch into there. And that'll essentially give us a wireframe of these bricks themselves, just like that. What we want, of course, is the top wireframe. So we don't want like all of this extra information. We just want the top part of that brick wireframe. So we're also going to create a list item component. Just there. I might preview that one off. So this list item by default is giving us list item zero, which is this bottom face. We want to change that index to a list item number five, which will give us the top face. So I've just created a little number slider and that'll give us that top face. And then instead of synchronizing these bricks, we're actually going to synchronize these list items. So on our AR device, instead of getting these shaded bricks coming through, we're now getting little outlines of the bricks themselves, as you can kind of see in my device there. And then as we kind of march up, because it's a parametric model, we get these um, outlines. And if we were going to go and fabricate this project, we'd get a very accurate alignment because we could see those outlines and align our bricks to them um, perfectly. Cool, so hopefully everyone got there okay. Um, one last thing that we're gonna add to this little part of the definition is you would have seen in this um, image, and I talked about it very briefly, is that we just do have the previous course's shaded outline, just to give clarification as to where you're up to in your course, and you can just you know double check that you're up to the right one. We're gonna quickly learn how to do that as well. So um, we're gonna basically create a shaded, we're going to move this shaded preview down one. So what I might do is I might actually preview that tree branch off. Um, and we're going to create a second tree branch component. Oops. And I'm going to get the meshes coming out of that again. And then I want to get the um, path just below this one. So I'm going to just create a um, subtract, subtraction component. And we're just going to subtract one from the course value that we've got here. So I'm going to grab this course value. And we're just going to right click on the B, set a data item and say one. Or maybe what I could do is I could create a panel so it's a little bit more obvious. We're just subtracting one from that course. And that's previewing it in Grasshopper. So then we just want to go ahead and synchronize that to our Phologram device, like that. So now in our device, as we move up and down the course, we're getting both previews of that brick wall. And we're essentially rep reciprocating this workflow that the bricklayers use down in Tasmania to build some of their complex brick wall projects.
Definitely. So, um, Brittany, I'm seeing your comments on the chat. Um, I've actually seen a couple of projects before done with like different depths of mortar. So if you actually had that built into your um, into your grasshopper model, you could use AR to get the mortar to a certain height and then place the bricks on top of that as well. So um, the mortar is actually controlled at the start of this definition is just a pretty simple base height. I think the height gap here is the mortar control. So if you were to change that value, you could change the height of the mortar. But if you wanted varying mortars, you'd have to probably write a slightly more complex um, algorithm um, and you'd be able to kind of create some pretty crazy brick uh, outcomes. Cool, so now we've gone ahead and created um, some really Oh, sorry, yes, yeah, so I'm say, seeing a, question, a quick question. So, um, basically, if you want to only see the synced objects in the PC screen, there's no super simple way to do it, but you just want to select all of these components um, that you don't want to see, right-click, and turn their preview off. So then you'll just see the sync object components. So just make sure you preview off components you don't want to see in Rhino, um, and you'll be able to just see what you're sending to the... Um, your phonogram device. Cool. Um, so one um, other thing that we might want to do with um, with this sequencing task, because right now, whilst we kind of know which course we're up to because of the um, parameters, if we had the parameters closed, it's a bit arbitrary as to know like which course you're currently up to. So we could use Phologram's um, text tag synchronization to basically send some text to our AR device as well. So you can find the um, synchronized text tag component just here under sync and it's called sync text tag. So I'm going to go ahead and drop that one onto the canvas there. So once again sync sync text tag And we're actually going to use a little component under the um, sets tab in text. There's a component called concatenate. Um, and this is going to enable us to join two pieces of text together. So we're basically going to edit our text as to what we want to see. So I'm going to grab that concatenate component just there. And the text that I want to create, I'm going to create a grasshopper panel. So a little yellow panel like that. And I'm going to call it course number. I'm going to put that into fragment A. And what this will do is it will join two pieces of text together. I'm then going to grab this course um, name here. And I'm going to put that into fragment B. And we could go and place the result because the result will be course number whatever course we're up to. We can go and place that into our text input, like that. And I think by default it's going to come out at zero, but we can go and change this as well to make it more parametric. Um, but basically now as we move up the course, you'll see that the course text will update so we can always have a reference as to which course we're up to. And we could go and make the size a little bit bigger because, you know, I mean, I've scaled this down pretty dramatically. So, I mean, if we made it 120, it'd be slightly bigger in our device. So it's a little bit easy to see which course we're up to. Um, so if everyone's got there, okay, um, let me know in the chat. If you're having issues specifically to do with the um, grasshopper, if you want me to repeat something, let me know in the chat as well, and I can go back over something if you want another concept, uh, concept explained. Uh, if you're having any connection issues, just th throw us a line as well, and I'll try and get Gwil onto it to help you guys resolve uh, any connection issues you're having. Um, one thing that I might just quickly talk about is um, how we could maybe make this a little bit more parametric. So this is a little bit more of a grasshopper trick. But say, for example, if we wanted our course numbers to align to, you know, 
um, basically where our courses are in AR. We could easily go and write something parametrically to get the um, the courses to sit there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bounding box. So that's this component here. It's just a box with four little dots on it. And I'm going to drop that onto the canvas. And I'm going to grab the um, the content coming out of this tree branch up here and just drop that into content like that. And in Grasshopper it's going to go and create all these, oops, it's going to go and create all these little boxes over here, which isn't really what we're after specifically. What you want to do with bounding box is just right click on it and go to union box just for now. I say someone says they've got some pretty thick um, lines. I'm guessing you mean the lines to do with the fabrication sequencing. I'll just preview that guy off. Um, which would be these guys. You can change the curve radius um, if that perhaps helps you out. Um, so go and I'd highly recommend you try and do that before you try anything else. Um, so just try and try and change that curve radius quickly. So once you've got your bounding box, basically what we're going to do is a bit dumb, but um, it's an easy way for us to create a parametric kind of relationship to place this text. We're going to try and get this vertex, which sits at the edge of this box, and relocate this course number six text just there. So I'm going to go ahead and deconstruct the breadth. And it's basically this little um, cylinder that looks like it's on fire. So if you want to go and grab that component, just deconstruct that breadth. And for the vertices, we're just going to grab one of these with a list item component. And it's going to be item number seven, I think. So I'm just going to create a slider that says seven. And we're going to drop that into the point location. So now our course number six is going to align with um, our AR model. So once again, as I'm moving up, that course number six, course number eight, course number nine, just appears nicely next to my bricks themselves. So you can start to create little kind of parametric relationships that convey the instructions that you're trying to tell, say, a fabricator or a bricklayer easily through Fologram. I might select these guys and just group them quickly, and I'll just give, give that a quick label. I'll call it add text tag, just so we don't get too confused by the spaghetti mess. I'm going to select these objects as well. You'll see them selected green, and just preview them off so we kind of see what's going on. Um, in Rhino that corresponds to our device as well. Okay, so one little concept I want to quickly introduce um, for you all um, is something called the state gate component. So um, Gwil is going to give a little bit more of a broader introduction to what the state gate component can do um, in about an hour from now. But I think um, I'm just going to introduce it as a kind of like basic concept for how we could use it in this um, kind of specific situation. So say for example, if we have this course um, 10 lining up and we see all of our shaded bricks and we see the outlines, but we want to actually just quickly swap out to our overall large scale um, brick model. Um, and we want to do that in AR. We can use the state gate to turn parts of our definition on or off um, straight within Fologram. So we could be inside of the Fologram app and we could swap between the overall brick wall and the current course we're up to. So I might just give a really quick demonstration on the side as to how the state gate works for our current purpose. Um, I'm just going to go file and create a new document really quickly. 
Um, and I'm going to drop the state gate onto the canvas. So you can find the state gate in the Follogram tab under Flow. There's a little state gate component. And this is probably the most powerful component, I would say, in the Follogram suite, or maybe other than the sync object component that sends all of your geometry. But um, basically, the state gate has lots of use cases. And like I said, Gwil's going to go through quite a few of them in more depth later today. Uh, but we're going to just quickly look at one really specific use case for the state gate component. So drop that onto the canvas and what you'll see straight away is it's a slightly different component to what you'd imagine usually. We have one input called states and that's a text, a piece of text we're going to input. Um, and then we have two outputs and they're true outputs and false outputs. But their nodes are a little bit different to what we would normally have. Um, so what we can do um, with a state gate for the true or false, um, we could plug in, say, a Boolean toggle. So this one here, a Boolean toggle component. And what this component does, as we know, is if you double click on the false, it'll swap to true. And if you double click on the um, true, it'll swap to false. So we've got two states here in the toggle. And we can plug that into the state gate. And basically, you'll notice that when I toggle between these two, the true goes green if true is selected, and the false goes green if false is selected. Uh, yeah, James, I just saw your comment. I'll make the definition available at the end of the day. I'll upload it to the forum. So what this is actually doing is it's transferring the data coming from this toggle into the state gate, and you know, basically um, enabling one of these outputs based on the information inside of it. So I'm going to go ahead and create, you know, our favorite mesh sphere. Oops. Mesh sphere. And I'm going to give it a radius of maybe 200 just for now. So it's going to be a big one because I think I've scaled my model down in AR. And I'm going to go and sync that object to Follogram like that. And you should see the sphere in your device over there. So I'll just align mine there and you can see my sphere. I'm actually going to make this one red. And then I'm going to do a second sync object. And I'm going to add the sphere into that one as well. And I'm going to make that one blue. Like that. So you'll see in my device that I get this overlap between um, these two spheres, which is you know a little bit messy. We're going to use the state gate to turn um, one of these components off and leave the other one on, and then swap between those two. So we can view the, um, the red sphere whenever true is selected, and the blue sphere whenever false is selected. So I'm going to go and drag from the output of the state gate where the true is and I'm going to connect it up to the sync object. So it's a little bit different to how a typical component works where you plug into something. This one we're just going to actually touch the component itself. So you'll see that I'm not actually plugging in. I'm just touching the component and I let go and we create like a nice connection between those two. Then I'm going to do the same thing with the false one. I'm just going to drag it over to the sync object component like that. So now we've got a connection where if the Boolean toggle is set to true, the red object is going to be um, the one we're looking at. And if the Boolean toggle is set to false, the blue object is going to be the one we're looking at. So if I toggle this button, basically what's happening is it's disabling this red component when true is not selected. And then if I swap back to true, it'll enable that component and disable everything else that's selected. So what the state gate is doing here is anything that um, is green coming out based on the current state, it's going to enable if it's touching that. And anything else is going to be disabled if it's touching that. So now we can easily swap between those two um, states. So then you could drop like a sync parameters on to the component like that. And then in our device, we could easily go ahead and swap between those two components. So this is a really powerful tool for, say, turning different parts of your de definition on. 
So how could we go and apply that to our brick wall um, scenario? Because you could see how this becomes quite a powerful tool for perhaps turning different instructions on at a certain moment. We can come back into our brick wall design template file um, over here. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to group these sync object components. I want everyone just to quickly group those guys. Like that. And then we're going to drop another um, state gate component onto the canvas. So I'll give everyone one minute to kind of catch up to that. Um, so just group these sync object components and then drop a state gate onto the canvas. Cool, so then I'm going to go ahead and create another Boolean toggle. And let's name this Boolean toggle. Let's call it turn whole, or say maybe we'll call it view entire wall. So then when it's set to true, we view the entire wall. When it's set to false, we um, only see the current course that we're up to, like that. And we can go and synchronize that to our device, so we've got it sitting there um, nicely. So, like I said, if it's false, if we're not viewing the entire wall, we want to view these two objects, which is our brick course and then our outline sitting on top of that. So the state gate also works with groups. You saw me just apply it to an object before, but if I go and drag this to this group, you'll see it highlights the whole group as I kind of hover over it. And I can let go and basically um, we could turn on or off um, that brick course now just from our device. So you can see how it's going and disabling both of those components because it's disabling everything within this group. Now for the true function, what we want to do is just create another sync object component and plug that mesh geometry into there. And I'm going to attach this true output to that sync object. So now when we swap between these, we can swap between the entire course and then between the, the current course. So we've got the whole wall and then the current wall. So then if you're ever kind of like laying your bricks and you just want to have a double check and see uh, maybe how much there is to go or um, how the brick wall is looking comparatively to um, each of the physical pieces just as an overall composition, you could easily use the state gate to swap between those two modes. Cool. So I'll give everyone just... Um, a quick five minute break now because um, that's a little bit um, of an insight into how you can go and create some fabrication instructions using synchronized sliders, synchronized objects and the state gate from the lens of a brick wall. Um, in five minutes or so we'll jump back on and what we're going to start looking at is how to create fabrication instructions natively in Rhino uh, so you don't actually have to use you know, a grasshopper algorithm itself um, to do this. Um, so if you're having any issues just get on to us in the chat and or if you want anything re-explained let me know in the chat or just any questions at all. I'll hang around for the next five minutes but we'll come back in you know at what it's It'd be 3.05 Melbourne time and we'll get stuck into the next portion of it. One last thing I would say is that if you have your own brick wall definition, you could probably just like remove all of this before it and up into the mesh component. If you have a similar data structure, you can go and input that and just move your own brick wall project into this. If you wanted to just experiment and tinker with this one, you could easily go and change the base geometry, which by default is just, you know, a basic surface. You could go and change some of these, you know, length or gap parameters as well. And of course, you can change the attractor relationship as well. So let's all reconvene in five minutes and we'll start looking at how we can do Rhino sequencing um, using this brick wall methodology as well.
All right. Um, cool. So hopefully everyone's jumped back on. Um, so as I mentioned before, now we'll um, kind of just apply very similar logic to what we've done in Grasshopper, but a much more simple approach um, and user-friendly approach if you're just a Rhino user. So we will use the Grasshopper model to get the geometry we need to create our sequences. Um, but essentially, um, right now we're kind of creating all of our sequences just using you know, the parameters tab in our um, you know, mobile or if you had a HoloLens device. Uh, but we could easily go and create very similar sequences just through the um, layers um, inside of Rhino. So what I might do is just come over to my layers tab and I might set a few layers up um, just to begin with. I'm going to create one new layer, I'm just going to call it brick course. And then below that I'm going to create some sub layers. I'm going to call it course 0 or 0, 0. Or maybe we could just call it 0, 0 because we've already got the label course, 0, 1. And you could just keep going and making these. I'm just going to do the first 10 for now. Um, and all of those will you know, get synced into your device, as you can kind of see here on my device in Fologram. So I'll give everyone just a minute to go and make maybe just 10 quick layers for your brick courses. Once again, if you've got any questions, just hop on the chat um, and let me know. Cool, so hopefully you've gone and made those courses. I'm just going to change my current layer to zero. And all we want to do essentially is um, make sure that we're on course zero. And we're going to go and bake um, this geometry out. So obviously on the first course, we don't have a lower level um, shaded brick. So we're just going to be baking out the curved geometry. So I can right click on that and go bake. And you can just select the layer you want to bake to and those curves will be baked straight away onto the course zero layer. Then we could go into course one, so I could move up a course, go through and bake both of the curve geometry. So right clicking on that Fologram logo on the sync object, clicking bake onto course one, and then the same with the shaded bricks, bake onto course one, and then we can start marching our way up through this order. So I'll move up one course and go ahead and bake these guys as well. So I'm going to bake that one. I'm going to bake that one like that. Move up a course. Bake. Bake. And I'll just do this up to number five. Bake, bake. So just one more. Bake, and bake. Like that. Cool. So now we can kind of just do away with the grasshopper definition a little bit. Um, so if I wanted to go file new document, um, essentially what I have now on my um, on my Fologram device is no Grasshopper parameters and no Grasshopper input in general, but I just have you know access and control to um, the layers in my model. So if I wanted to change courses, I could easily just go and change like the layer. So obviously you need to make sure your current layer isn't um, one of those selected if you want to turn it off. So I could drop down to course 4 and turn course 5 off, course 3, course 2, 1, or 0. And so then you're able to also create fabrication sequences and instructions just natively in Rhino. So if you, sorry, natively in Rhino, yeah. 
And if you had access to the full Fologram app, say if you were like a premium s subscriber, you could go ahead and save this model offline. Um, so then you could kind of take it anywhere without that live connection, which gives you kind of like the power to, you know, do this sequencing without that live grasshopper connection. So a pretty simple way to just transfer it over to Rhino um, for simple fabrication instructions. Cool. Um, so if you want to go and give that, I might just give her in two minutes to try that out. So just get some geometry on different layers for different sequencing and just get a feel for how all that's working. So um, then you become, you know, adept at both this um, sequencing fabrication instructions approach from a grasshopper perspective, but also from a rhino perspective as well. Uh, and then once you're done, just give those files a save um, somewhere and we can move forward to the next little task, which is going to be taking a look at the um, timber fields project that we started working on yesterday. We're going to take a little bit um, of a look at how we can go and apply some of this sequencing logic to that. So I'll just give everyone two minutes to go ahead and try out that um, brick course instructions if you um, just need that extra time and then we'll move forward in a couple of minutes. The other thing I'll do is I'll just um, get my grasshopper file up just if, in case everyone wants to have a closer look um, at that one on the screen. All right, cool. So I think what we'll do now um, is we'll move on to these timber fields. So I'm going to go to file and I'm going to open up um, this field design fabrication template file. So of course, you know, this is found on the community forum. If you haven't downloaded it, it's just the same post as where you would have got the brick wall design. Um, and we can get stuck into looking at that one. So this is going to be uh, a similar algorithm to what we used yesterday and what you experimented with yesterday. Uh, but I've added a few things for more fabrication based um, focus. Uh, you can definitely integrate this uh, definition into your own designs. But just for now, I recommend let's use the template one. Uh, and then you can have an experiment around with um, your own definition from yesterday if you've tweaked it or changed it and try and integrate them together. Cool, so you'll notice straight away that my, um, my phone's kind of changed and the geometry has kind of disappeared. Um, I think I should have some fields. Oh, no, yes, I know the, there's one other thing that we need to do um, quite quickly. So one thing that I should just remind everyone of what we were doing yesterday is that we had the units set to meters because Grasshopper's fields components are a little bit weird when you try and do millimeters um, and their settings are easy to tweak for meters. So if you just want to jump into units, um, so oh, sorry, I'll just redo that. So type in units in the command line 
and just swap this um, units over to meters or conversely you could just go file new um, and just go to large objects meters like that and we'll have a new little file with our grasshopper parameters. So one other thing, I think my um, scale is quite small, so I want to get that to one, two, let's see if I can see my fields somewhere. Maybe they're not being synced right now. There they are. I might just make it a little bit smaller. Oh, let's go one to five for mine. And then you can clearly see the field aggregation just there in the distance, like that. So you can have it whatever scale you want. I'm just putting it at 1 to 5 so it's easy to see on my screen. And I'll just give everyone a minute to open that guy up and just get the unit set to meters. Cool, so um, I'll talk through the changes I've made to this definition just really quickly. So yesterday we created um, these kind of um, mesh sphere control points like this that we were easily able to kind of move around on a curve and update the field um, aggregation. We also added control over these planes um, and they all fed into basically they kind of populate some points on a mesh pipe and then spawn a field simulation that creates these kind of swirls um, that move around the um, spin forces that we've created inside of the algorithm. Then those field lines basically spit out and create these kind of um, timber lofts. So I've got a little bit of a um, timber strip algorithm that's taking the cross product of each curve's control point and creating a lofted geometry um, which results in these strips. And then of course we added a sync object component to apply the timber um, material on top of that. And then perhaps you've gone and experimented and tweaked um, this algorithm further to um, create your own design. So I saw a few kind of interesting ones on Instagram um, last night when people were posting them. Um, people were posting some interesting ones where they were aligning it to their um, to their room, which was good to see, uh, because it's always good to try and use these as a contextual thing. It's kind of like what we were talking about at the end of yesterday. It would be good to try and design this field so it contextually fits within um, your space or your room. So what I've just added in today, essentially, for our um, fabrication sequencing is a little part of a definition that will go and um, reorient some of our timber strips so that they're kind of lying flat on a um, on the XY plane um, and that they have little timber preview chocks um, or basically adaptable formwork that sit um, and kind of enable the bending process. So as you would have seen in the presentation that Gwil gave yesterday, um, in the Thailand steampunk project, the way that we were able to bend these chocks over the timber um, the timber strips, or the, the way that we were able to bend these timber strips over the chucks is that we'd create these um, adaptable formwork and place them using the HoloLens and then go and bend um, these timber sh shapes over that adaptable formwork. So essentially what I've just kind of added into the definition um, is a little algorithm that takes you know one of these strips somewhere in this aggregation and orients it flat onto the XY plane just in the middle of the definition. Um, then I've created a little bit of an algorithm that just creates little planes at each kind of division um, over 10 divisions along the strip. And then along those strips at each of those planes, we're basically extruding out to the XY plane to create um, these little chop previews that you see in the definition. So the first thing that we want to do is just um, send this kind of outlay geometry to Folagram. So you'll see 
in my origin, I don't actually see this geometry right now. We want to go ahead and send that geometry straight away. So I'm going to come over here to where these two purple circled mesh prep outputs are, and I'm going to click on uh, this bottom one. You'll see this bottom one corresponds to this strip that's laid out on the ground. And this top one actually corresponds to the actual strip somewhere within this aggregation. So there it is there. It's basically taking that little strip and orienting it flat out on the XY plane. And we're going to just set up a little sequence um, pattern just like we did with the bricks so that we can create um, a sequencing approach in our AR devices. So I'm going to create a sync object component just here and I'm going to send that um, strip to my device. So you'll see in my device I'll get that strip appearing like that. And as we did yesterday, we could right click on the Phologram logo and go select texture um, and we could go straight to the, um, the day one resources if you've got it lying around easily and apply that timber file um, to that strip. So then that should update nicely like that on our, um, on our device. So then the other thing I'm going to do is just create a little sync object component for this guy. And this won't be the best process, but I'm just going to make him red. So it's a little bit obvious where in our aggregation the strip that we're currently looking at is currently sitting, just like that. So you can see that easily. Cool. So the other thing I'm going to add right at the end is I'm going to synchronize these little chocks so we can clearly see them. And I'm going to plug those guys into there like that. And now we see those chocks coming through in our AR device. So pretty simple stuff straight away. We're just sending some simple synced objects to our device. So once again, those are these chocks from cat holes at the end of the um, definition. And then we've got you know, some sync objects coming out of these mesh preps here, which represent the strip location on the flat plane. And then the, um, the uh, strip highlighted somewhere in the aggregation. So then the last thing we're going to do, it's going to be actually a lot simpler than what we were doing with the brick um, sequencing. We're going to once again um, go and create a sequencing slider uh, and then apply some text geometry. So this number slider here is the one we're going to use for the sequencing. So I'm going to drop a sync parameters component onto the canvas and sequence that sequence, uh, sorry, synchronize that with my device. So now I can go and um, change, you know, the timber strip that we're up to. Uh, we could right click on that guy and call it strip number and then resynchronize it. So then in our device, we've got, you know, a little um, slider that's called strip number and we can easily go through each of those strips in a sequence as we fabricate them. Uh, so James, it sounds like you might just be having a scale problem. I just check in the edit menu um, what scale your kind of whole model is at. So just go and double check that guy um, to get the scale right. And also double check that you're using um, meters as your units uh, inside of Rhino. Um, so we hopped over to from millimeters to meters because the fields algorithms are a little bit more friendly when you use them in uh, meters units. So now the last thing we're going to do is we're simply going to outlay some text geometry to make our sequencing a little bit more obvious. So exactly what we've done before, we're going to come up to the sets tab and I'm going to go to text and get concatenate and drop that onto the canvas. I'm going to create a little panel and I'm going to call this part number like that. 
And I'm going to plug that into fragment A. And of course, the thing we want to join it to, because this is going to enable us to join two pieces of text together, is that fragment B. And we're going to get part number zero. So then we basically just want to go back to the Phylogram tab. And we want to grab a sync text tag component. And I'm going to plug the text into there like that. And we could potentially make it slightly bigger um, because we're in meters, the size is coming at 0 0.05. So maybe I'll make it 0 0.15. So then we can clearly see which part we're up to in that sequence when we're just visualizing it in AR. So now I can step through those parts really easily. So once you've kind of got that relationship working, I highly recommend you go and um, visualize this at a one-to-one -one scale. So you can get a fit, feel for some of the um, sizes of your strips in your model. So I'm just scaling mine up to one-to-one -to -one, and I might reset it so it sits on the ground. And then I can go and have a walk around this strip and see just how large some of the pieces are. I could go through and try and find some different kind of outcomes. Some of them are a lot more kind of crazy and curvaceous, of course. So that one's got some pretty intense curves going on. Um, and just go and walk around, um, create a video, get a feel for how big these kind of parts are um, in this sequencing. Um, in terms of your other definitions, so if you've gone and created a bit more of a custom um, design with your, um, with your Grasshopper file, um, you can easily just go ahead and copy basically all of this into your old definition and just hook your lofted geometries up to a, this list item index component and you can go ahead and um, coordinate your own definition. Uh, yeah, I can repeat how you scale to one to one. So just go to the edit menu and you can pinch in and out. And you can kind of see just under my edit menu, there's a little scale that says one to one. Um, and you can slowly just change those settings like that until you get to one to one. Another way to do it, just um, maybe is a little new way. So if everyone wants to watch this, if you go to the Phylogram tab in Rhino, you can easily just change this number here, which is relative to the um, scale as well, and just change that to a 1 and go Apply Scale, and you'll see in my device that updates the scale as well. So that's another way you could update the um, scale. Uh, yeah, so just a question. Um, if you want to record something, just the middle bot button at the bottom in the user interface, hold that guy down until it vibrates, and then you will be able to record um, whatever you're seeing in your device like that. So you'll be able to record a video and then just tap it once to stop the recording and that'll save the video uh, to your settings, uh, to your um, mobile device. Cool. So um, hopefully that's working for everyone. We're probably going to take a, um, a five minute break now because that kind of wraps up the main portion of the sequencing part of today's session. Uh, so Gwil's going to jump on shortly um, after this and he's going to go ahead and start running through a much more in-depth look at the state gate. Um, so I'll hover around in the back comments, but thanks for joining on for this session. Um, I'll try and resolve a few of the issues that a few of you guys are having just in the background as we go forth. Um, so if you have any other problems, just let me know in the chat and we keep moving forward. But let's, have, let's all have a five minute break and then Gwil can jump on and take over the stream for the next um, probably hour, I say, he's probably going to talk for in this workshop. Thanks guys, um, I'll see you all in the chat.
Yeah, so this is pretty cool. Hi everyone, <clears throat> how's it going? Uh, just give me five minutes and we'll get started. Okay, we're back. Um, quick switch over. So for the remainder of this, um, this session, um, now that Sean has taken you through a couple of, uh, let's say more finished design projects um, and examples, we thought we would go into a little bit more depth um, to discuss some of the use cases for the state gate component. And that's because this component works quite differently to most other components in Grasshopper um, because it's developed really with building mixed reality applications in mind. Um, there aren't necessarily a ton of use cases for the state gate if you aren't working with Fologram and it works um, in some kind of uh, both novel and powerful ways. So there's a few things um, that I wanted to talk about really. One is I wanted to discuss pretty much the four different ways that you can use the state gate to control data flow in your Grasshopper definition. Um, and those are to run part of your definition once. So to make a set of components in your definition, do something once and then stop. Um, or to toggle between two different options in a definition. So for instance, you might have a situation where um, you want to switch between I don't know, um, drawing a part as a solid and drawing a part as a wireframe, which I think um, Sean used the state gate for earlier on. Or maybe you want to start building an application which actually has a pretty sophisticated user interface to it. So maybe with Fologram, you want to make something um, which lets you model in mixed reality in kind of a similar way to how you might model in Rhino. Uh, maybe you want to be able to draw curves on your mobile phone and then edit the control points of those curves and then select curves and then loft a surface through those curves and then edit the control points of that surface and then change the materials and then bake it. That's actually possible to build uh, with Fologram by building essentially a little mini definition that de does each one of those things and then switching between them as you need them using the state gate. And then the last um, fairly frequent use of the state gate as you become more experienced working with Fologram is in using the state gate to do things based off of uh, like when particular events get detected from your mobile phone or from the HoloLens. So quite a common use of the state gate is when you're building applications where um, you want to do something when you first tap on the screen and then do something else while you drag and then do something else while you release. So for instance, you might want to, when you first tap on the screen, you might want to get the closest control point 
to where you tap and then while you drag you might want to move that control point and then when you release you might want to save the new position and redraw a curve through those new control points just as, a, as an example. And so that's the third use case um, for the state gate or the fourth use case, sorry, fourth input case. So let's um, have a quick look at how the state gate actually works, what it does. I can explain what's happening <clears throat> under the hood with this component. And then I'm going to show you um, more practically speaking what this looks like in terms of a bunch of very, very simple, fairly general abstract um, definitions. All right, so what's happening with the state gate um, under the hood? So let's make one. That's this component with the two branching red paths called the state gate or in Fologram, it's in the flow menu um, where it says state gate. And the default component uh, looks like this. So I'll see if I can draw full names for you. So it has an input which is a set of states and these states are just text. You can tell that they're text based off of the little A icon um, of the parameter type uh, on that input. So you plug in some text here that can be um, a list or a single item and then what the state gate does is it matches output names um, to whatever the input text is and it enables the output that matches the input text. So the default outputs are called true and false, right? And that's because a really common use of the state gate is with something, let's make a toggle, sorry. Is with a toggle as an input. Um, and so when you plug in a toggle that is equal to true and what the state gate is doing is it's interpreting this not as a boolean value but as a text t-r-u-e it's finding the matching output called true and then it's enabling that output and I'll talk about what I mean by enabling in a second so when the input is false it does the same thing it finds an output called false and it enables it if we plug in something which where we don't have A matching output then nothing is enabled so I've connected a state here called not true or false the state gate is trying to find a matching output it can't find any and so it just disables everything now another thing with before I talk about what enabling and disabling actually mean um, the state gate has dynamic output parameters. So that means when you zoom in on the component, you can add or remove more of these parameters if you need to. So let's say that I wanted to have a parameter that was called not true or false. I can zoom in on the component, click on plus to add a new parameter, and then rename that parameter to whatever I like and the state gate will work in exactly the same way. So now we've connected not true or false as an input to the state gate. It has found an output parameter with the same name and it's enabled that one. So we can have any text input here. Um, so literally, let's say we want to do make a state gate that has um, draw, edit, delete let's say there are three different states that we want our state gate to control I could rename my outputs so we have draw edit and delete and it'll work in exactly the same way so when we plug in a state which matches an output that output gets turned on the other ones get turned off now how you actually use um, this state gate is the bit that makes it kind of interesting um, because these outputs here you'll notice as I drag on them they're not making the normal looking grasshopper wires so the normal looking grasshopper wire is a black dashed line whereas the state gate outputs are a yellow dashed line they look a little bit different and that's because the state gate doesn't actually pass data through the component at all 
um, the state gate represents literally a hard gate in your definition that you can open and close. Um, so you can prevent parts of your definition from running at all by using this state gate. So let's say that I have um, a bunch of components here that draw stuff. So for instance, I'm going to make... Um, this won't be a phologram component, but let's say we have a curve component with some vertices. I'm going to draw some vertices in here. Du, 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 du. That's my uh, drawing part of my definition. Now what the state gate lets me do is it lets me switch on components or groups of components. And it, basically what it does is it enables or disables the components. So it does the same thing as right clicking on a component and choosing enable or disable. A good practice using the state gate is to work with groups just because it reminds you that you aren't actually connecting to any input. What you're doing is you're turning data on or off in your model. You're enabling it or disabling it. So I've grouped this component even though it's just one component here because then the state gate shows me nice and clearly what it's doing. It's this um, state gate is controlling this group of components and setting whether or not they are enabled or disabled. So you can probably start to see what's happening here. So when we plug in a state that matches our output, so for instance draw, these components get enabled, the other ones don't. So I'm just going to make some dummy components for the other ones. This is my edit component for instance and um, we'll make a few of these just so it looks like a little fake grasshopper definition. We'll group those, that can be my edit group, and then this can be my delete group. Okay, so I have little chunks of grasshopper definition here. And let's see what happens. So when I input edit, my edit components get turned on and all of the other components get turned off by the state gate. So this component is no longer doing anything, these components are no longer doing anything, only my edit components are running. Then when I switch to the delete mode, now my delete components are running, or they run once depending on how these components are actually working in the background, and the other ones are switched off. When we switch on draw, my draw component gets enabled, the other ones get disabled, and if we plug in something which doesn't match any output, then everything gets disabled. So this is fundamentally how the state gate works. You're enabling or disabling sets of components based off of an input condition. Um, in this case, whether or not an input bit of text matches an output bit of text in the uh, state gate parameters. So that's how the component works. Let's have a quick look at some applications of the component. So I'm going to turn off um, full names because it makes my definition really messy. So the first thing to look at is um, using the state gate to run something once. So when we want to, you might not want to run something once in Grasshopper. That might seem a little bit counterintuitive. I mean, by default, how Grasshopper works is it runs things once. It'll step by step go through each one of your components in your definition run the little bit of code that is inside of that component, output some data, and repeat until there's nothing left to execute. But um, the difference here is that w because what we're doing is we're connecting Grasshopper to an external interface, in this case it's a mobile phone or um, a HoloLens device, we're always listening to events from that mobile phone and we want that mobile phone to be able to tell Grasshopper when to run quite a lot of the time. Like maybe when you push on a button, you might want something to happen. You might want to save part of your model or you might want to delete part of your model or you might want to like increment one in terms of the um, courses of bricks that you're fabricating. You want to be able to trigger changes in your Grasshopper definition. So to build buttons like that, where you push a button and something happens, this is a really common pattern. So you have literally a Grasshopper button component. That component is usually synchronized, which means that you can change it on your mobile device. 
and the button just gets plugged straight into a state gate and the state gate just has one output. So when this button is true, which, which for just a split second it is when you push on it, you can see as I hold this down, the state gate's outputting green. So when you push the button, that state gate will just update whatever it's connected to once. So here's some examples of how that works. Now often when you're using the state gate to run something once, you're working with Fologram's global variables and we're going to talk about that more, them in sort of more depth tomorrow. So there'll be a similar tutorial like this tomorrow, but just looking at global variables. For now, it's enough to understand that global variables are a little bit like data recorders. So they store some data inside of a component and let you access it anywhere within your definition. So they're like a data recorder in the sense that they store stuff, but they're different to a data recorder in the sense that you can access their data without necessarily needing to have a kind of a linear flow um, of, of information without needing to necessarily connect something directly up um, to your global variable, which you're going to see in a second here. So here's a really common use case for, um, for global variables, and that's saving objects to a list. So or for global variables and the state gate, sorry. So let's say that I have a bunch of, um, or even just a single object in my model. So in this case, it's a, a sphere that I've synchronized with um, Fologram. I've made this object interactive, so it's movable. That means I can move it around. And then I have a button over here where when I, whenever I click on this button, what it does is it runs this group of components here. And that group of components gets a list of objects, which are stored in a global variable. It gets the current position of my sphere, adds those two lists together, and then updates the value of my objects list. So essentially what this is doing is it's putting the current position of my sphere into that objects list. So let's just see what happens. I'll move this sphere somewhere else. So I've moved it over here. I'm gonna hit save, boom. You'll see those components updated just for a split second. And they saved into this objects list the position of that sphere. So let's try that again. I'm gonna, I'm just pretending to move this around in mixed reality, but I'm doing it in Rhino instead. So I've moved my sphere over here. When I hit save, boom, it's gonna save that position into my objects list. And now I have two of them stored here in this global variable. So the state gate is just making sure that this only gets run once. And that's pretty important because otherwise, if I moved this sphere around, Normally what would happen with Grasshopper is this is updating, and so this is updating, and so anything connected to it would also update, which means that every time I move my sphere, it would be saving the position of that sphere in this list. And I don't want that to happen. I only want it to save when I push the save button. Okay, so we're controlling this collection of components using this button. A really similar use case is to reset stuff. So here I've got a reset button. It's connected to a state gate, which means that I can turn this set of components on and off. And the only components I have here is just, well, you'll, you'll see in a second, but I'll copy this so you can see what this looks like. Oh, and now it's run. It's just an empty list, so it's nothing. And then that's updating my global variable. So it's essentially resetting this global variable back to nothing. So let's um, move this around a bit. I'll save those things again. Save. Save. And now when I hit this reset button, these components will get run, boop, and it'll delete um, those spheres that I'd saved before. Another really common use case um, is in doing some sort of simple computation. So for instance, let's say I have two different buttons. One of them, I want to add something to a list and the other one is to subtract something from a list. Exactly the same sort of pattern. So I have an add button. Whenever I click on this add button, this group of components here updates. All this components do is um, get the value of a global variable called my number, add one to it and update that global variable again. Ditto for subtracting. So when I add one, you can see my number is getting added to, add, add, add. Whenever I hit subtract, 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 my subtracting components are running and removing one from that number. 
So this is sort of a pretty powerful way to start building, you know, here we're just adding and removing one from a number, but you could imagine that this is useful for making user interfaces. You might be able to step through values or design options whenever you tap on a button. You might be able to use it to gradually increment how much you move an object from one place to another. It's useful for really fine detailed control of exactly where something is in space. Really the sky's the limit. So I'm just adding some numbers together here, but you could use that to build something more powerful. Uh, last quick example of um, using the state gate um, in a one-shot way with a button is for instance maybe you want to like save or retrieve um, the position of your phone when you tap a button so for instance you might be creating some animated camera paths um, and you're using your phone to simulate where that camera is at any one time you might make this button whenever you click on this button what it does is it runs a set of components again exactly the same as all the other examples which are getting your device position and then saving it to a global variable. Now I don't have my phone connected here, so this is a little bit boring, but um, when you click on save device, these components run and it would save it down here. So it's a good way of getting something once, whereas normally these components here are updating all the time um, and you might not necessarily want that in your grasshopper definition. Uh, we got a question. The output data of a state is always a Boolean, right? Um, no, so the output, the state gate doesn't actually output any data at all. Um, the state gate is only turning on and off things which are connected to its outputs. So by default, those outputs are called true and false, but they can be called anything. You can rename them to whatever you like. And how the state gate works is when you have something that's inputted, oh, I forgot to rename these ones, so draw, edit, delete, fake. So let's say here we've got four different um, strings of text called draw, edit, delete, and bake. If an input matches, like if the name of the input matches the name of the output, then these components get turned on. But there isn't any data that is being outputted from this parameter. It's not outputting anything. It's only it's working very differently to any other Grasshopper component. Um, what it does is it's enabling or disabling what is connected to it, rather than passing some data to it. Hopefully that helps. Blah 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 bara. <laughs> A great name, by the way. All right. Um, next one. So this one is also very very common. Probably the most common. So it's using a state gate to run one of two options. So you're inputting something like a toggle into the state gate. This is used for lots of different things. So for instance, we might have a toggle that toggles between showing a wireframe and showing a, um, a mesh, like a solid representation of an object. So I'll try hiding all this stuff so we can actually see what we're looking at. Okay, so I have show wireframe on false, and that means that the components which are being are being enabled when they're connected to this false output, so this one here, and that one is just rendering the sphere. If this is set to true, then the components which are connected to true are getting enabled. So that's the edges here. Super duper simple. Another common use case is to switch between different input modes. So you might want to build an application where sometimes you use the position of your phone to trigger changes in the model, and other times you might want to use multi-touch gestures to trigger changes in the model. So this is doing the same kind of thing. So we have a toggle, which is asking us use device. You would be able to turn this off and on on your phone if you synchronize it. When it's set to false, a set of components are being enabled which use the pointer position of your device. When it's set to true, a set of components are being enabled that use the device position um, to store this global variable. So that's another super common pattern to switch between different input modes. Again, you need global variables here to store that, that variable to use later on in your definition, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, another common pattern while I remember it is, and somebody asked me this on the forum the other day, is can you, 
Someone asked, can you synchronize timers or data recorders uh, with Fologram? You can't synchronize them in the sense that you have one of these cool little Fologram toggles next to a timer or a data recorder, but you can very easily turn them on and off using a state gate. So let's say for instance, you have a timer in your definition. Maybe what that timer is doing is, um, I don't know, it's updating literally like a counter component or something. Um, I think that'll work, will it? I'm not sure. Yep, so that timer is now updating a counter. Tick, 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 doing what it's supposed to do. And let's say I want to turn this on and off um, using my mobile phone. How we would do that is we would group it and um, we could just have it connected to a state gate. So this one is use timer. So when use timer is set to true, these components are updating. When it's set to false, they're disabled. So you can see that timer is no longer updating anymore because I've disabled it um, using a state gate. So that's another really common use case. So it'd be the same with a data recorder or something like that. You could just literally enable or disable that component um, as you need it using some sort of pattern like this, like a synchronized button or a toggle connected to the state gate, connected to whatever components you want to turn on and off. Okay, getting into some slightly more um, interesting, exciting examples now. This one is, is um, really useful for building more sophisticated applications in Fologram. So let's say you wanted to make a modeling um, application in Fologram that had several different modes, a draw mode, an edit mode, a delete mode, and a bake mode. Normally it'd be really hard to control the data flow of your parametric model to make sure that those modes weren't just turning into spaghetti, like everything is connected to everything else and your definition runs really, really slowly. So what we can do is we can use the um, state gate with a value list component. And a value list is just like a drop down list in Grasshopper. And you can synchronize these with your phone, which is really nice. So we can make a value list, which has the names of our different modes. So for this example, I've made a couple of different rendering modes. So solid, gradient, wireframe, and outline. And if this is synchronized on your phone, then you'll be able to change this dropdown um, yourself on the phone. Then this is connected to a state gate and the state gate outputs, again, they have to match what our inputs are going to be. So we have solid, gradient, wireframe, outline. And then I've just renamed these to be solid, gradient, wireframe, and outline and then connected those up to four different groups of components that render the geometry in those four different ways. So solid is simple, that's just syncing the sphere like before. The gradient um, group, that does a whole lot of stuff. So I don't want this running all the time unless I've got it switched on. So it's deconstructing my mesh, it's um, getting the Z position of, in fact, let's just switch this on so we can see it. And we'll have to turn on the preview. It's getting the Z position of all of the vertices, sorting those and mapping them, finding a match, like a corresponding color along this gradient, colorizing the mesh and then synchronizing that instead. So we get this nice gradient representation in Fologram. The wireframe mode is the same as before. So just getting the edges and syncing it. And then the outline mode, which we, I don't think we'll see here. You'll only see that on your phone. That is using the outline setting um, on the sync object component, which shows just the silhouette, which is kind of useful. So the idea here is that you can create almost like entire mini definitions that get turned on and off based off of a state gate. So in, within one grasshopper model, you might have 10 functionally different mini definitions, which you turn on and off using your mobile phone and a value list. And the idea is that you switch between these modes and then just change what is displayed, like what is synchronized back with your phone uh, afterwards. Okay, so these grasshopper definitions, in this case, they're very simple, but they could be very complex. Um, you can turn an entire massive definition on and off with the state gate if you wanted to. All right, last example is um, using device state to control the state gate. And so these ones, these get closer to being, I'd say, expert Fologram 
um, users. So you really want to be comfortable with all of these other things, um, with globals and, and all the rest of it before you start building these kinds of applications. But there's a few good tutorials um, covering how to do things like this uh, on the forum. Um, they're typically labeled as export expert tutorials, so you can have a look at them if uh, this is of interest to you. So to give you a, look, a quick example here, um, uh, we have a component in Fologram called track state. And what that component does is it tells you what a device is doing at any particular moment in time. And it just tells you as a piece of text. So it says it can be in one of five different states from memory. Um, either it's detected an event um, and then that event might be called press or drag or release or it's lost an event. So as you go through the motions of interacting with your phone, um, let's say you tap on the screen, drag your finger around and let go, these events get fired in this order, detected, press, drag, release, lost, and this component will output that text. So if you want to do something when a user presses on their phone um, or on their screen, you can use this pattern here. So you um, check to see what devices are connected, you track the state of those devices, and then you use a state gate to turn on and off parts of your definition based off of the state that the device is in. So here's a practical example of that. So let's say, for instance, we want to build a, a user interface for an application where a user can um, uh, tap and move vertically the closest um, I don't know, a bit of geometry in a massing model. So this is my extremely simple massing model for the point of um, a tutorial. These boxes have been synchronized so we can see them on the phone. And now we want to do one of two things based off of how the user is interacting with this model. So when the user presses on the screen, we want to do um, one set of things, right? So when we first press, what this set of components do is they get the list of geometry that we want to interact with. They get the pointer, so the position um, of our pointer when we first press, and this is always updating. It's telling us where we are all the time. It's finding the closest geometry to our pointer position, and then it's sorting that geometry based off the distance and outputting um, the closest bit of geometry. So what this is doing is when you press, it just outputs the closest box, basically, to your press position. And we only want to do that once. You don't want to be doing that necessarily while you're dragging around all the time, both because it'll make your grasshopper definition really slow, running this these components all the time, um, and because you might not necessarily want that behavior. So as you drag, you would be suddenly picking up a different model if it was closer than the one you're currently dragging. So that's not necessarily desirable. We just want this to happen once when we press. And that's because of user behavior. Like typically, if you're interacting with something, you'll press near the thing that you want to move. Um, you won't press miles away from the thing that you want to move. OK, so then while this drag event is firing, these components get updated or turned on, right? So while um, drag is turned on, what we're doing is we're getting our live pointer position. So this is changing all the time. So this component's always updating, ding, 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 as the component um, or the pointer changes. We're getting the position when we first started dragging. So this is a global variable that's storing that position, finding a vector between the two, turning that just into a Z vector, just for the purposes of demonstration, and then we're moving our closest geometry and resyncing it. So what this definition would do is as we tap somewhere on the screen, it would get the closest um, box, and then as we dragged, it would move that box snapped to the z-axis. Just as an example of, of how we might use the state gate. All right, so that's um, uh, hopefully gives you an overview of these components. They're not intended necessarily as as cool working demos by any stretch of the imagination, but rather to try to explain um, how these different inputs work and the context in which they're used. This definition is on the forum, um, so you can go find it. I'll try to show it up here. Under state gate examples, 
Um, so feel free to download that, have a play around with it. And then if you have questions or if you've got ideas for how you might want to use the state gate um, in the task that we'll give you guys uh, over the next few days, feel free to post them and discuss them here. Another thing that's worth mentioning is a lot of the examples um, in the examples category on the forum, they also use the state gate. So you can go and find practical examples of how this has been used um, pretty easily, uh, which might help you with your own projects as well. Okay, next thing to do um, is to have a quick chat about the uh, homework, let's say. So Sean and I will show you, um, you know, uh, example projects and explain how Fologram works, but you have a much more time uh, on your own outside of these tutorials to try to um, put some of these new, new techniques and skills into practice. And we've got a shiny new platform that we want to use um, for helping you to communicate uh, and share some of the work that you've been doing uh, throughout this workshop. So this is going to be a bit of fun. I'm going to post a link into chat. Let's get all 50 of you in here. Um, so <laughs> jump on that link and um, I'll meet you in this virtual studio space. So we've created a platform called at studio uh, for viewing and sharing uh, models online. Um, this is really intended as a way to recreate design studio culture in some way. So to share or recreate things like pinups, presentations, exhibitions, desk scripts, informal discussion of models, uh, things like that. But we're going to try using it in, um, in this workshop as well, just for you guys to essentially um, show off your 3D models of your work and be able to share them with, you know, with your friends and family, um, as well as for us to be able to, to discuss them in the last day of the workshop. So you can see I'm um, seeing everybody's gradually loading this model and jumping in here. Um, so this is a shared 3D space. There's 12 of you in here. Everybody's got to get in. Um, you can see where other people are. You can interact with them in some pretty basic ways. So we can share views and sketches of the project. And we can also do some cool stuff like making animations. Now, what I might ask you to do is, down in the bottom of the screen, you'll see this button that says follow. Could you all turn that button on? So just hit follow for me. And when you have follow turned on, um, that means that whenever somebody shares a view, your camera is automatically going to go ahead and match it. Now we can do some cool stuff. So I can make some really, really simple animations of this project. So I'm sharing a view that's flying over to one side of this structure or spinning around it. And if you have follow turned on, you'll be seeing this same thing. So what this is going to let us do is essentially make some really nice, simple animations of our project that we can share with everyone. We also have a shared whiteboard that you can all scribble over. So I can see there's 12 of you who've been following me. So you've jumped into this. Okay, I, th I think I'm back. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I guess we'll find out in a second. But yeah, so this, this is the platform that we're going to be using um, to share these, these models. So what I wanted to do today is first of all show you how we can use App Studio. Um, so how you can publish your own Rhino models to this platform. And then to give you a very kind of um, a simple and hopefully enjoyable design challenge um, for you to work on before uh, the next tutorial, or really until the end of the um, uh, of the end of the workshop. 
Okay, so to get at studio running, let's go to app.studio slash download and I'll plug this link into the chat as well. And what you want to do is to just click on the download for your platform. So if you're on Windows, download the plugin for Windows. If you're on Mac, get the plugin for Mac. That will download the Rhino plugin for App Studio, and that lets you publish models directly from App Stu uh, from Rhino to App Studio, which is kind of nice. So you'll want to download that, um, install the plugin, and then really you should be installing this. Make sure you have Rhino closed, but if you accidentally have Rhino open, that's fine. Just restart Rhino after you've installed this plugin. Um, it should install for all detected versions of Rhino. If for whatever reason it doesn't, that's okay. Go to app.studio slash... Actually, no, don't go to that. If it doesn't um, install for all versions of Rhino, there's a very common um, reason for that. And uh, you might need to install the RHI fix utility. which is just a problem with installing um, Rhino plugins generally. So if you had a problem with installing Fologram, just check out this RHI fix utility that might solve the problem for you. Okay, so once you've got the plugin um, and it's all installed, ready to roll, uh, let's try publishing something. So I'm gonna open the same uh, yeah, let's use this one. So this is what I published earlier. It's a chunk of the steampunk pavilion. And uh, perhaps some of your field models will look a little bit like this after you've gone through the design task. Now in that studio, you can publish um, NURBS geometry, and uh, mesh geometry. If you publish NURBS geometry, it's gonna be automatically meshed for you. Be careful if you're publishing things like pipes, you might accidentally be creating tons of geometry. So with this project, I've already meshed it, which just means making you know a, whole, a sort of low poly faceted representation of those NURBS strips. Just make sure that it publishes super duper fast. If you have any trouble publishing your model, then you do wanna to go to app.studio slash troubleshooting. So um, I'll just make sure this is in there for the stream. There's a few tips here. You can also find this by clicking on the help button. And there's a troubleshooting page, but we have a bunch of tips for um, helping you publish your model if something goes wrong. Um, but to publish your model, um, so we publish meshes, NURBS, Curves aren't published. Um, because we're rendering stuff in the web browser, we're, we're only rendering uh, meshes in the end. So if you have curves that you want to publish, you'll probably want to mesh those first. You can publish images and drawings. So if you use the Rhino picture command, and try and find a picture. You can place any image in App Studio. that'll publish fine. Okay, so I've, essentially this is how we can make little like pinups and presentations and things like that. And once you're happy with how your project looks, in Rhino you just type in publish. So extremely easy. There it is in a web browser. This is just a preview of the model so far. So we can do a few things with our preview. You can change the background if you want to. You can have a sexy dark background or a, you know, whatever color you want, a crazy background. We can change some um, sun angles and if we want to, you know, change the focal length of the camera. Just really, really basic things. And what I would like you all to do is once you've finished your design task, this is just, um, at the moment we're just seeing a preview, you'll want to share it. So you click on the share button, 
you can give your model name whatever you want, maybe call it your name, um, or you can call it, give your project a cool name. And you want to publish it to Digital Futures. So that is going to be the name of the room that we will use. Um, I've got a, a little note about this um, on the forum. So design task in Art Studio. That's the name that we're going to use there. Um, so you want to publish it to Digital Futures. If you publish it to a different room, it'll just show up somewhere else. So we want to make sure that we're publishing to that one. Don't be, um, don't be shy about publishing multiple models. It's pretty easy to organize them. Um, uh, someone's asking for the fixed utility. Yep, sure thing, I'll post that in a tick. Okay, so when you hit next, um, then it'll ask you, you might have to sign in. You can sign in with your um, uh, Google or Microsoft accounts, or you can create an account with your email. Um, all that does is just associates you with your model so that you can delete it and edit it later if you want to. So I'm going to go back to this Digital Futures page. I'm not going to save that one. Cool, there's still a bunch of people in here. There's 20 people in here now, that's good. I'll hit share view so you'll pull over there. Um, all right, so once you've published it, it'll show up in this room. So at the moment, I'm the only person that has uploaded a model um, to the Digital Futures room. But as soon as you guys publish some, they'll show up here as well. Um, and you can always share a link to your project by copy pasting that um, and posting it on on Facebook or wherever you want, um, then other people will be able to view this in a, in a web browser. Um, if something that I've covered so far doesn't make any sense, there's a couple of simple tutorials on the homepage. Um, there's this link here, watch tutorials. I mean, that just goes to a Google Drive folder with a few short videos. Um, so you can watch those if you if you feel like it'd be useful. All right, so that's that studio. Um, don't be shy about publishing stuff there. You can publish it and delete it, or you can just publish another project. Um, it's just a good way to quickly share your your work. Last thing for today. Looks like we're going to finish about half an hour early, which gives you a bit more time to work on stuff um, and to post questions on the forum if you have them. Sean and I will be kicking around for a bit longer is the design task. So um, what we thought would be interesting is um, to get you guys to have a think about how you might actually build the timber strip definition that Sean was showing you earlier. So he showed you an example of setting out formwork for the timber strips and that lets you fabricate an individual strip but it doesn't necessarily help you with assembling those strips together because all of the strips are just floating in space. And this is something that's pretty common, really, with um, uh, parametrically created uh, grasshopper models. They tend to make very, very complex form, but without necessarily um, giving you a sort of a simple way to build that form. So we thought as a task, it might be interesting for you to have a go at um, trying to create some joints between these strips. And depending in, on your experience with Rhino and Grasshopper, you could approach this in a number of different ways. So if you have not really used Grasshopper much before, what I would suggest you do is you bake some of the, um, uh, the strips from the definition that Sean gave you, and then you just model some joinery um, uh, geometry in between them. And that joinery geometry could be really anything. It's up to you. Um, you know, it could be something like um, folded steel, like we did with the tile in pavilion. It could be doweled joints that intersect and run through the strips. It could be a framing system. There could be cast, cast parts that hold these, um, these strips together. Just a sort of an idea for how they might be fabricated. And the advantage of fabricating things in mixed reality is each one of those joints could be unique. Um, 
they don't necessarily have to be heavily rationalized, though that's, that's entirely up to you. And so as you're modeling something in Rhino, you might want to think about how they're built and how they might you know, potentially be, be um, fabricated using some sort of holographic instructions. If you're a, um, so that's if you've never really used Grasshopper at all, you're not confident. If you're a beginner Grasshopper user and you want to have a go at modeling something parametrically, then um, I would suggest you start looking for Grasshopper tutorials that uh, parametrically create lines between curves. So perhaps by proximity or something like that. And using one of those tutorials to try to create a kind of a network of joining parts in between these timber strips. You might want to think about um, exactly what these parts are, like are they uh, some sort of bracket geometry, are they folded bits of steel, are they dowel joints, what are they? But um, the main thing is just parametrically generating some connecting geometry. If you're an intermediate Grasshopper user, you might want to think in a little bit more detail um, about how you could use the specific geometry of this timber strip um, to inform some sort of fabrication system. So like we did with the Tallinn Pavilion, these um, brackets, these red things here, they're picking up on the orientation of the timber strip. So they're informing the exact curve of the strip at any one location. Uh, you might be able to model something similar. So you might be, you know, um, getting the surface plane of a strip at two points and then using that to create a little connecting component in between the two. Um, that should be something that's possible for intermediate um, grasshopper users. That, or you could design something really different to what we did in Tallinn. Like maybe you, um, you could just design some laser cut plates that fit the strips if you wanted to. Um, though those plates maybe would want to be cut out by hand um, uh, using a sort of a holographic model in some way. Now, if you think you're an um, uh, uh, expert Grasshopper user, if you've got a lot of experience working with Grasshopper, then the next bit of the challenge really is to start thinking about um, how these joints might actually be fabricated. So what are going to be some of the fabrication constraints? If you're doing doweled joints, um, are you needing to drill through the strip at a particular angle to insert the piece of dowel? Do you need to rationalize the dowel into specific lengths? Uh, if you're doing folded joints, what are the limitations of the fold angles? How do you minimize the number of connecting parts? Could you rationalize parts into a sort of a small set of repeating parts for joining these strips together? Um, that's sort of up to you. Um, all of that should be possible to start thinking about if you're um, an expert Grasshopper user. Now, the obvious, this obviously goes without saying, you're not actually going to be building anything in this workshop. I mean, unless you, you have access to a workshop yourself and can fabricate some of these things. And so this is not by any stretch of the imagination a, um, a, like a, a, you know, a tightly constrained exercise. I think it's just important to think about how you might connect the strips and what might be possible if you're working from holographic uh, instructions rather than having to rationalize everything into flat geometry so that it could be digitally fabricated, for instance. Um, last tip is there are a ton of examples on the forum that Sean's put together for a load of different ways of building um, parametric models. A lot of these are design tools, but there are a couple of fabrication tools uh, in here as well. And so it could be a good place to start if you've used Grasshopper a little bit before to work through a few of these um, Grasshopper examples to try to find some ideas for how this might be built. And then the other um, great resource, I think, is just going to be the Grasshopper forum. You'll be able to find tons of um, parametric models which help you to model joinery geometry um, between these strips. And then your job as a, a designer over the next couple of days is to just think about okay, how, is, how does this joinery need to be informed by a fabrication process? Um, right, so that's, um, that's it for me for today. So because we've got an extra half hour, it's a bit of a luxury. I'd say um, jump into this task, review the video. Sean and I will be on the, on the forum um, and can follow up with any questions or ideas that you have there if you want uh, direct feedback or um, some sort of like contribution uh, from us on, on what you might do. And the plan is um, tomorrow the course will work in a pretty similar way, the tutorial. So Sean will go through some examples and I'll talk about globals in a bit more depth. 
And then on the final day of the workshop, um, the following day, we'll have uh, half of the session will be a tutorial and half of the session will be an at studio. And we'll use Zoom on that final day so that we can review and have a chat with you about um, the work that you've published there. So you've got a couple of days uh, to work on this project. Um, feel free to post it to at studio or the forum in the meantime. Um, we're always kind of interested in what you're doing and, uh, and happy to discuss it.